So our next speaker is Chidozi Egesi. And I think Chidozi gets the award for coming the furthest. <laughs> he uh, is a cassava breeder in Nigeria. He works for the National Root Crop Improvement Center in Nigeria. A uh, recently named project manager for the Next Gen Cassava Project for Cornell University. Uh, he's now based at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan, Nigeria. He's led efforts to develop and release several improved varieties of cassava, um, including pro-vitamin A cassava. As the project manager for NextGen Cassava, he coordinates project activities aimed at increasing the rate of genetic improvement of cassava by partner institutions in Nigeria, Uganda, Brazil, Colombia, and the US. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'm going to give a talk on bringing cassava breeding into the 21st century. I'll try to weave breeding and a little bit of diversity, genetic diversity into the talk. Um, so many people are not listed here, like the Brazil or Seattle, they are new members of the project. So it's an in international effort, uh, but basically three breeding programs in Africa are involved in the next generation cassava breeding project. Um, cassava crop in Africa, um, is a, many people do not know this crop, is a critical source of uh, food and income for at least 500 million African families. Very important for their food and nutrition security. Cassava is a crop that can do very well in marginal environments and has outperformed other crops where climate change has been happening, the major crops, maize, wheat and rice. is a, is especially grown and produced processed and marketed by women. And um, we think that um, any effort made to improve this crop will be very crucial to African development. But the problem is cassava originated from Latin America, and um, the few introductions that happened in the 16th and 17th century came from Portuguese traders, uh, 16th century to West Africa, and 17th century to Eastern Africa, and so there's a, a limited genetic uh, base for improvement. And like Paula mentioned, that is a prerequisite for breeding. So um, I have a chart here that tells a little bit about the work, um, the 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 work we've done with African cassava, and um, you can see that it is clearly separated from the ones from Latin America, which are. It tells us that we, we still have not captured a lot of um, diversity that are, are available for the crop. And the same group of um, materials, you, you notice that uh, around this colorful place is where most breeding programs are using. Nobody in Africa has, used, has explored the use of materials from SEAT and others from wide relatives or interspecific hybrids. And this, is a, this, is a, this has been a bottleneck for cassava. And recombination, because it's a vegetatively propagated crop, re recombination has not been happening. So people clone whatever works for them, and they can clone a variety and use it for 50 years, 20 years. So um, the cassava breeder has a big challenge. And um, what, there are so many, but I'm going to just be focused on a few. And one of them is biotic constraints, which impact on production and utilization of genetic diversity. So in Africa, especially Eastern and Southern Africa, this is a big matter, a brown streak virus disease, uh, a brown streak disease caused by a virus, and another virus that is widespread across Africa and India, uh, cassava mosaic disease, and all, all other, many other diseases or pests, as the case may be. So this has really impacted on utilization of materials from South America. For example, this is a plot that uh, NRC Arayu Mudike a few years ago, when we introduced materials from SEAT, breeding line is a, is a wonderful breeding program they have. We introduced their materials along with Nigerian adapted materials. And you can see the difference. And this is consistent wherever you grow it in Africa. So. Uh, we can just summarize that uh, Latin American materials are useless in Africa because of a cassava mosaic disease. So 
the disease wipes off the crop that you don't have anything to grow. And how do we make, uh, I mean, how do we overcome that? And I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give a slide or two later on about that. So back again to the breeders challenge, um, next generation cassava breeding project has, I mean, had to articulate all these problems into one slide as I'm going to show you. Uh, a lengthy breeding process, and so we need to shorten the breeding cycle. Um, also, uh, most, f most uh, genotypes flower poorly, so even when you have good materials, you cannot unlock the diversity in it. So we need to improve a flowering and seed set. Uh, I already mentioned the limited jam plasm in Africa, and um, new resources are available now, gen genomic resources, a lot of data. How do we manage that and use them in breeding? Um, so we actually came to the conclusion that we need better tools. And these are the things that next-gen cassava breeding is doing, and I'm going to focus just on the first one to shorten uh, um, breeding cycle, and then I'll mention a little bit more on um, integration of Latin American jam plasm, just a little bit. So this is a project, what we set out to do. Um, like I said, a lot of genomic resources have been generated. This is a previous effort we did with uh, our partners in University, UC Berkeley. So we, we were able to have a, a high resolution a genetic map that is being used. So our aim is how do we keep this from ending at high-end science, high end, high you know, academic activity? How do we bring this to bear on breeding and then bring the benefit to the African cassava farmers? I told you most of them are poor women in the rural areas. So we sought different options. One of them is to implement genomic selection in cassava. It is new. I mean, genomic selection is new generally, but for a crop like cassava, which is uh, uh, called an orphan crop, this was a huge thing. And in summary, it, it, it involves the building of a reference or training population that you will phenotype and also genotype. And um, you develop statistical models that relates to the genotypes to the phenotypes so that in the end you don't have to keep phenotyping. Um, so the training population model can generate genome estimated breeding values of even on a, on evaluated selection phenotypes. I mentioned that already. So what we thought to do uh, two years, two and a half years ago when we started this project was to develop what you can call a Pan-African uh, training population. And we worked with uh, three breeding programs and were able to um, come with a total of over 6,000 uh, varieties that we phenotyped and genotyped. And we even had to do with um, historic uh, phenotypic data over years for ITA particularly that kept good data. We had like um, seven, years old, uh, seven years old data for that people in the national programs, we had like two to three years. So historic data was part of it, and we used over 40,000 SNP markers. This was a huge effort, and um, I'm going to tell us a bit about how we have progressed with that. So we, back again to genomic selection. From the training population, we're able to um, select parents based on their breeding values after we have genotyped them. And we have here like about a, over 100 appearance that we now had to also begin to group as the as the, as, the, as you can see here so we had to like form what you can call a pseudo heterotic groups it doesn't happen in cassava and what are we trying to do uh, from the training population you can call it the cycle zero we will now have parents make crosses generate the first cycle but yet it's very far from the breeding target we were dealing with everything but we want to capture as many um, as many alleles as possible, useful alleles. So even in the second and third cycle, we are still not, we, we, we are the third cycle. We still think we are not yet at the breeding, at, at, the, at the targets that we've set. But we think that by the fourth cycle, which should be by end of next year, we should have hit most of our breeding targets. And you know, for a breeder's equation, you need to consider so many things, like this selection intensity, is going to be very impact on the quality of the selection you make. Um, selection accuracy, which will be, um, which is a correlation of your predicted values 
and they observed uh, uh, genetic values, and um, the 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 the. <coughs> the additive genetic, which is actually what the parent will transmit to the offspring. Then key to us is cassava is a long season uh, crop, 12 months it takes for one season. So we need to see how to cut that breeding cycle. Very important to us. This is a typical breeding cycle. You start from making crosses in, this is year zero, because you plant them out. They grow for like uh, uh, four months, three to four months before they start flowering and you harvest your seeds like three, two to three months after you make crosses. So that's almost a year. <laughs> that's why I call it year zero. And then you begin to plant your seed. And before you get to a, a variety release, you are more than, you're about on the 10th year. So this is very tough. And what happens here is that you do both parental selection. You have to select the parents, and then you come back here to do the variety selection. Those are two processes that happen without you know, they, they happen at the same time, but they are different considerations, a big thing for the breeder to handle. So what have we done with our, um, sorry, if you go back to the, um, you, you'll see that before you can begin to make use of uh, um, materials from the, uh, the generate, uh, materials you generated, you have gone past the third year. This is the earliest, and this is very unrealistic. Most times it's down here that we begin to plow materials back to the crossing block. But what we're doing with uh, our genomic selection is that you have faster cycles. Because you have trained the model, you're, you're able to generate um, um, information that is shared among the parents <laughs> that you're using. You can begin to make uh, selection for parental selection at the years one and two. And um, but while you're still going on through the years, you'll be able to uh, train the data. That is, take data back to your training model and make better selection. So parental selection are based on genome estimated breeding value. Uh, and then we, we, we make progress, uh, as I'm going to show you. Um, so again, to unlocking the genetic diversity of African uh, uh, cassava, we need to introduce materials from Latin America. So one thing that's, I, I mentioned this before, that CMD is a big thing. A few years ago, what happened was that with SSR markers, we were able to work with our partners in SEAC to have a dominant marker called CMD2. But we, we saw that again in, in the, after we evaluated our over 6,000 materials that I mentioned. And we saw that it is the major, it is a major QTL driving resistance in cassava. And but in addition to that, we had other 15, uh, 15 other SNPs on different chromosomes. Um, this, this, this CMD2 is located on chromosome number eight. So we had six, uh, uh, about 15 others that are contributing. And it depends on the combination you have. It shows you the kind of uh, symptom reaction, whether almost immune or, or recovery kind of uh, symptom expression. So, the thing I needed to mention is that today we've been able to release varieties in Africa because of this uh, CMD2. We've made, be able to make crosses with um, mat uh, materials from uh, Nigeria that where the CMD2 was identified to Latin American materials. And some of, uh, I'm going to s say it quickly, uh, about over 10 varieties have been released. One other thing we are doing with this is that we now have an international crossing site in Hawaii. We are working with the USDA Hilo, where we are making, uh, um, we've been able to raise some materials from uh, uh, seeds from Africa and seeds from SEAT, and we took them to uh, Hilo. Crosses will be made this year, or are being made right now, and then we hope to share the seeds to diff the different breeding programs in Africa uh, that are involved in this project for a start and then we hope to take it forward. So these are, in the past um, three to four years, we've been able to release this number of varieties in the different countries, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Ghana. Um, back to genomic selection, we, we have also seen that we are improving on the resistance, uh, uh, the proportion of resistant plants that we are having in, in our populations as we move from the first cycle to the, I mean, the zero cycle, the training population to the first cycle and to the, and to the cycle two. And we are 
evaluating cycle three now to see how much improvement or whether we have plateaued. But the important thing is that that is happening because we are now succeeding in concentrating the frequency of uh, resistant homozygote in particular, in particular varieties. And this is happening because we are working with a suite of alleles rather than uh, uh, um, per, uh, phenotypic selection that we were doing previously. Again, this question comes, and it's been asked by many people, does genomic selection improve selection accuracy? Um, I'm going to end with uh, one or two, three other slides to tell us how much we've done for CMD, Cassava mosaic disease. We, we've been able to raise uh, uh, or reduce the incidence level, uh, the severity level in our population. Again, genomic selection is not about variety improvement, it's more on a, a population improvement, moving the population forward. So it, it, with data from a pre, uh, uh, the last couple of years, we've been able to see that uh, the, we, we are making gains in, uh, we're making gains for in, in improving in resistance to the disease. Again, for another trait that is very important, dry matter content, we are also making gains, as you can see, the population uh, means is, is increasing. For root yield, this is very, um, this was very, uh, this is rare to see, but we saw it and we, we hope to check again when we have the new <coughs> cycle, whether it is truly true that we are making this kind of fantastic gains in yield. This is, this looks unreal, but this is what the data says. And we, we hope to find, we hope to, uh, um, we hope to see this. So again, does genomic selection work? We, 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 we think it works. We believe it works based on our data. And it's not just that it works to, re, to improve varieties, but it works in the thing that we, we are moving, we are shifting the population mean to what we desire. And that is to this area of the curve. So in summary, we can say that genomic selection has helped us to predict within families and make selections for uh, 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 make selections for good parents, make se uh, make selections for good genotypes, and move the mean of the uh, population forward to our desired target. And it's working particularly. We are sure it is working particularly for CMD and dry matter content, especially in reducing the cycle time and increasing the selection accuracy because you can say but you can do phenotypic selection for CMD quite easily, but it takes you a longer time to do without genomic selection. And um, we, we, the same for dry matter content. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about other things we've done. Uh, cassava is a, is, a, is a bulky, <coughs> perishable material. It's very difficult to phenotype. Again, genotyping is getting cheaper and cheaper. Okay. Genotyping is getting cheaper. So how do we improve phenotyping? So we've been able to, through this project, work with some companies to, to get um, a handheld uh, knees, a spec that we use to scan for different traits at the same time. And um, we generate spectra that we can now use to uh, um, this is this is revolutionary because it's going to help us assess for quality uh, root quality traits. Many of them at the same time, just by one scan. And uh, we've already started this. Uh, again, I'm, I don't want to waste time there anymore. We have we have what you call cassava base. We have a new database, cassava base, that is able to manage both geno gen genotypic and uh, phenotypic information store it and also f analytical uh, tools that you can use to perform genomic selection or GWAS or any kind of analysis that you have. And it's open database. It's an open database publicly available. You can uh, already search for it and acquire data. We've been able to accumulate a lot of data in the past um, few years. We've deposited over 20,000 <coughs> accessions and we have have nearly half a million. It's over this right now. Half a million. Um, phenotypes deposited there by different breeding programs. Even Thailand is putting data there. SEAT 
putting data there. And we want to make this a global resource for every cassava worker. So my last slide is this. We, we've been able to deploy um, Latin American materials in Africa because we, we, have this, um, we have this gene that we're using to uh, introgress in, uh, in resistance to South American materials. Well, we, we've learned that is a big change for the small breeding programs to move from small numbers to big numbers. So managing large population sites is one of the challenges we are building capacity for, and, and everybody is coping with it. It was it's quite unbelievable. Um, we know that bioinformatics is a big is a global problem, and we are working on this to train young people at uh, BTI. Uh, phenotyping, we've already started work on that. And rapid, rapid cycling time is what we still need to optimize. The time it takes to uh, extract DNA, make your decision, select your parents, and then begin to make crosses. That is really one of our biggest things. So, well, I say that more rapid gains, expectedly, are with the trace of um, large effect loci like the CMD. Um, I'd like to thank all the people who have contributed in, to this work. And um, some people are historic, like Generation Challenge Program, and um, many others. I didn't put Embrapa here, but we are working now with Embrapa since January this year. Thank you for listening. <laughs>